This is Vern Venom Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. If God is the creator and father of the entire universe, many scientists and theologians conceive it to be both arrogant and egotistical for human beings to think themselves the only creatures God made. Dr. Robert Jastrow, director of the National Aeronautics and Space Institute's Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City, has recently predicted that he thinks beings from outer space will be contacting the humans of this Earth within the next 40 years in order to guide civilization into the galactic community. Professor Jastrow points out that since we Earthlings began broadcasting by radio and television, these high-intensity signals have been beaming out into space at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. These signals have already swept past approximately 100 stars, many of which may be sustaining intelligent life, he says. He feels certain, and here I quote him, that word has reached these distant beings that there is something going on here. Yet as one considers the conflicts and turmoils of present life on this planet, one wonders how prepared the peoples of our world would be to expand the cosmic horizons of their citizenship. Recent centuries have chronicled a history of tremendous difficulties in getting along with our own races of this earth, much less with citizens from elsewhere beyond our sphere. The ravages of world wars, border disputes, international hostilities, and provocations of violence all bring urgently to human consciousness the fact that far supersedes the necessity of technological and scientific advance is the urgent mandate of spiritual progress. Humankind must learn more than tolerance and the suspicious restraint of aggression. Humankind must learn love. Only thus will we survive amicably with brothers and sisters on this planet, much less with aliens from another origin in space, as the eminent astronomical scientist Dr. Jastrow has predicted will become a reality within the next 40 years, within the lifetime of many. The first and most urgent priority for planet Earth is a global spiritual renaissance of love for one and all, black, white, red, yellow, and every dialect and continent and culture. One family we are, and it is mandatory that thus we begin to live. Wrote the philosopher Blaise Pascal, right without might is weakness. Might without right is tyranny. We must therefore combine both right and might, making what is right mighty and what is mighty right. And love is the greatest power in the universe. Joshua Billings depicted this humorously. There is no revenge so complete, he wrote, as forgiveness. And love which is able to transform individuals is able ultimately to transform this world. The peoples of our planet are learning that we are one family, environmentally and ecologically and that all must cooperate in the solving of mutual problems. An example, 100 nations of the world have recently met in conference in the attempt to stop the global spread of deserts. The best scientific estimates indicate that the world is losing approximately 14 million acres of fertile land every year to these advancing deserts. Already some 43% of our planet's land surface is either desert or semi-desert. Soil and environmental analysts predict that another one-third of today's farmland will be lost within only the next 25 years unless the spread of deserts is halted. However, one international statesman was quoted as saying that the desert problem, quote, cannot be solved in isolation, but only through cooperative efforts of all the peoples of the world. Humankind are learning that in order to survive on Earth, we must learn to cooperate ecologically and environmentally, but even more of vital importance than that, humankind must learn to cooperate spiritually. For unless and until the peoples of the world begin to manifest direct and committed concern about the fates and welfare of the other inhabitants of the earth in love, our cooperation in moments of crises will be but sporadic and fitful at best. The only way humankind will begin to think globally is to realize that all of humankind are members in one spiritual family, the family of God. Such is the most logical way in which to think of the world. Some misconceive God to be a vengeful tyrant, but God is not only the source of reason, God is reasonable. Years ago, the president of Columbia University was visited by the superintendent of grounds. This man was upset because he said the students won't stay on the sidewalks. They cut across all the lawns all the time. The president of the university paused for a moment, thought, then answered, so build the walks where the students want to walk. God, similarly is authoritative, but not tauntingly capricious. God is reasonable, 
and is not in the least interested in interposing meaningless restrictions and arbitrary legalities on humankind. The central law of the universe is to love God and love people. St. Augustine, when asked his summation of real religion and ethical behavior, replied, love God and do as you please. There ought to be a joyous and carefree attitude in living by faith. This is an issue transcending creeds and rites and rituals. Sometimes when I'm out on the road speaking, I'll be driving a rented car back from my hotel trying to find the airport. This is not always an easy task. In some cities, finding the airport is complicated. But I've found a quite simple solution. Rather than leaving the freeway and asking directions, I will start looking for planes. And once I notice where they're circling, I head for that and have never missed a flight. It doesn't matter whether I can see the wind socks, weather station, hangars, and control tower... If that's where the planes are circling, I know that's the airport. I have the same approach to religion. When I see a human being, regardless of race or culture or dialect, who is abounding in love and truth and goodness, and above all, in love of God and love for people, that's it. I don't have to see that person's denominational membership card or learn what organization that person is a member of or see a copy of his prayer book or his theology text or watch him go through his rituals or say his prayers or explain the Trinity any more than I have to look for the windsock and the runways to know it's an airport. I look for the planes and among human beings. I look for the love and the truth and the goodness and above all the love of God and the love of people because that is religion. Everything else is explanation. There was a little eighth grade boy whose mother had just had a baby and the next day at school the lad came carrying a cigar box. The teacher was wondering what he was up to until he opened the cigar box and began passing out lollipops announcing to his classmates, I'm a brother. One of the profound spiritual experiences of life is the realization that you are a brother or a sister, that you are literally related to the entire human family, that you stand not isolated and alone, but as a child of God and as a brother or a sister to every other human being. At first, such a thought may seem terrifying, but ultimately it becomes a source of joy. And eventually there will come the day that you actually desire to celebrate this truth of human oneness. The day that the entire idea of it all begins to seem so grand, so sweeping, so wonderful and warm a thought that you want to start passing out cigars and lollipops. And that day will come to the world. It may come slowly and in much travail, but that day will come to the world. Love is not merely an emotion. It is a decision and an action. It is wanting the greatest good for someone else. A person cannot really hurt you by hating you unless he has caused you to hate in return. Hatred is the most hurtful thing of all. Consider this contrast. Human progress has been phenomenal in recent decades. An example, people who would have been dead without transplant surgery are now living an additional eight to ten years with transplanted hearts and livers. Agriculturally, the Dairy Research Institute reports that cows are now yielding twice as much milk as they did in 1945. Then in the United States, there were 25 million dairy cows producing 119 billion pounds of milk. But the current statistic is that although we have only 11 million dairy cows, less than half, they are producing 120 billion pounds of milk. Or consider the areas of health and medicine. A recent science bulletin reported that Mariam Ali Goreh, a 20-year-old woman of Somalia in Africa, may be the last person to have smallpox in the history of the world. The report goes on, thanks to the World Health Organization and its intensive prevention program, the disease that once maimed and killed thousands has virtually been eradicated from the earth. And the World Health Organization has been given a special public health service award for, quote, its historic achievement in the imminent eradication of smallpox. And yet in a world of longer lifespans, heart and liver transplants, increased agricultural and dairy production, and the eradication of diseases which were once worldwide plagues, are human beings living more joyous lives? more peaceful and purposeful lives, more loving and understanding and wiser lives. Vital as it is to progress scientifically, technologically, in health, medicine, and food production, the ultimate questions of life supersede even these issues. Do people know who they are and why they're here and where they came from and where they're going? The greatest issues of life are spiritual. 
And the greatest need of humankind is for a spiritual renaissance, a new era of love and goodwill, of faith and hope and joy, the quest for truth, beauty and goodness, the worship of God and the love of humankind. Without that transcendent achievement, the rest of human progress will be fitful and ultimately futile. The urgent and crying need on this planet is for love. To speak cruelly of another human being can cause pain long remembered. Recently in El Monte, California, an 11-year-old boy was bitten by a rattlesnake. His mother had chopped it in two with a shovel. But authorities reported the snake's head bit the boy on the thumb in a dying reflex action. The boy had to be hospitalized. Harvey Fisher, reptile curator at the Los Angeles Zoo, who identified the snake as a rattler, said this is quite common, that a snake is cut in half and will still cut and bite in reflex action. So it is with human cruelty. The words you speak of someone possess a kind of life of their own, and even if later you apologize for having gossiped or if you attempt to retract truthless words hatefully spoken, they often possess an existence unfortunately independent of rebuttal and continue to wound the innocent for years to come. Real love is desiring and doing the best good for another. There's been a fascinating sociological study done by Dr. Andrew Harrell, associate professor of sociology at the University of Alberta in Canada. He conducted an experiment involving 84 persons. Half the group was placed under a trustful supervisor who told those working for him, I've got enough confidence not to bother checking up on you all the time. But the rest of the group worked for an untrustful work supervisor who repeatedly made such remarks as, quote, I know you're going to rip me off, or I'll bet you took a lot from me this time, end of quote. Dr. Harrell found there are a lot of people who will take advantage of your trust, but he added the statistical evidence in this experiment shows that if you trust people, you will encourage trustworthiness in them. In other words, the trusting people helps them to be honest, end of quote. Taught Jesus, do to others as you would be done by. George Childs wrote, Do not keep the alabaster boxes of your love and tenderness sealed up until your friends are dead. Fill their lives with sweetness. Speak approving, cheering words while their ears can hear them and while their hearts can be thrilled and made happier by them. There was an old man from the country who recalled this outstanding moment from his childhood. He said he'd never forget it. One spring day, he wrote, My father called me to go with him to the blacksmith's shop. He'd left a rake and a hoe to be repaired, and they were ready when we came, fixed like new. My father handed over a silver dollar for the repairing, but the blacksmith refused to take it. No, there's no charge for that little job, but my father insisted, and the old man wrote, if I should live a thousand years, I'll never forget that great blacksmith's reply. Sid, he said to my father, can't you let a man do something just to stretch his soul? There's the secret. Let not a day of your life pass by that you don't do something to stretch your soul. Henry David Thoreau wrote, That man is the richest whose pleasures are the cheapest, and the pleasures of love and truth and beauty and goodness, and above all, the quest for the will of God and the love of God and the love of others. These are the supreme delights of mortal life. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.